Adolf Hitler declared that men who succumbed to lust were weak and pitiful. Of course, he was above such things. Hitler claimed he abstained from sex to preserve the thing he called the flame of life. And it was a sacrifice he was willing to make for the mother. His adoring followers lapped it up. Hitler said that by preserving this flame, he improved his energy and endurance. And this meant he had more to give back to the Reich. This played into the mythology the Nazi propaganda machine constructed around him. The German people believed their leader was the model of self-discipline. He was impervious to all base human weaknesses, including sex. As a young man, Hitler had no conventional sexual contact with any woman. What is meant by conventional? And what did Hitler mean by flame of life? According to various occult teachings, such as those of the Rosicrucians, the concept of a soul or spirit is illustrated or articulated as a flaming fire of life. In fact, there's a Rosicrucian aphorism that states, quote, The fire is in everything and everywhere. There is nothing dark or cold within its sphere. The symbol of a universal life force energy has always been the flaming fire in all occult teachings and was expressed alchemically as a red triangle. In fact, the word pyramid comes from pyre, meaning fire in Greek, and mid, meaning middle. The Rosicrucians combined symbolism belonging to various religious beliefs and practices, including Hermeticism, Jewish mysticism, and Christian Gnosticism, but the esoteric knowledge that they possessed was handed down to them from ancient times, predating those faiths as a secret wisdom or arcanum belonging to the Aryan Magi of Mesopotamia, which comes down to us as magicians, as they were the custodians of the mysteries of the flame, which was disseminated to other parts of the world after the fall of Babylon. The arcanum was considered as heresy by the emerging religious elite, and so it was disguised and hidden. The word arcanum comes from the Latin arcanus, meaning a deep secret, often used in reference to the mysteries of the physical and spiritual worlds, particularly in the context of alchemy. This secret has been encoded into every great mystical and religious tradition, its symbolic meaning only known to initiates, as throughout history it has been forbidden to reveal the secrets of the great arcanum to the public. Thus, its mysteries have remained a hidden legacy, veiled behind mystical stories and the world's inheritance of art and literature, for all to admire, some to imitate, but few to understand. Concealed within the enigmatic monuments of ancient Egypt, buried in the watchful eyes of the Vedic gods, cloaked in the myths and legends of Greek mythology, and illustrated in the cryptic pages of the old books of alchemy, the essence of what occult authors and mystery schools call the secret doctrine has always been there. Since antiquity, only an elect few were initiated into the esoteric truths unlocking the guarded mysteries, which gave them an advantage over the rest of humanity, who were misled about the covert symbolic meanings of their faith. The occult secrets were fiercely protected, especially as humanity progressively degenerated into barbarism, so the divine knowledge went underground to survive behind the veil in isolated pockets around the world. Whether one looks to the symbolic meaning of the feathered serpent of the Aztecs or Maya, known as Quetzalcoatl or Kukulkan respectively, or the serpent that climbs up the caduceus of the Greek god Hermes, the serpents of the Hindu or Buddhist traditions, 
or the snake in the tree told in the biblical story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. All of these seemingly different examples contain the same hidden teaching, told in different ways, but containing the same universal secrets. While most, if not all, modern mainstream religions have been infiltrated and manipulated to promote a political agenda through social engineering, they still contain ancient divine knowledge which can be deciphered by the wise, diligent, and ungullible. Author and alchemist Samuel Ein Wyor once said, all religions are precious jewels on the golden string of divinity. The word religion derives from the Latin root religare, which means to bind or union. The word yoga is derived from the Sanskrit root yuga, which also means union. At their core, the different spiritual philosophies describe the same goal, union with divinity. Various religious traditions provide the keys that one must use in order to reach unification with the divine. According to the Bible, in Matthew it says, For the gate is small, and the path is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. While they use different names and symbols, they speak of the same gate or path. In Greek, that path is called gnosis, which means knowledge. In Hebrew, the same path is called Dat, which also means knowledge. This path is represented by the famous Tree of Knowledge in the book of Genesis, which has a literal interpretation and an esoteric or inner meaning. According to the Zohar, a Kabbalistic text that includes commentary on the mystical aspects of the Old Testament, quote, the narratives of the doctrine are its cloak, the simple look only at the garment that is upon the narrative of the doctrine, more they know not. The instructed, however, see not merely the cloak, but what the cloak covers. The symbolic meaning of the characters and events in the Bible has either been hidden or rejected entirely in favor of a literal interpretation that unwittingly veils the mystical context. For the better part of the last two millennia, those who were initiated into the secret teachings were persecuted and forced to take the knowledge underground. As a result, the modern church has inherited merely the cloak. That said, the Bible has undergone repeated translations and editing by those without any knowledge of its mysteries. For example, the very first words of the Bible are translated as, in the beginning, God creates. But in Hebraic translations in the Zohar, it says, quote, In wisdom, Elohim creates. Elohim is a Hebrew word. The root El is Hebrew for God and is masculine. The feminine form of El is Eloha, which means goddess. Elohim is plural, thus meaning gods and goddesses, male and female. So, in contrast to the familiar image of a bearded old man, God is established in the first three words of the Bible as containing both male and female. Eden is a paradise of perfection, symbolic of humanity's natural state of happiness, knowing only virtue. While the Bible describes it as a physical location between the Tigris and Euphrates River, where there once was a Chaldean mystery school, it is also a metaphor for humanity's fall from grace, which brings us to the two trees in the garden. The tree of life is universal in meaning and is found in all cultures that have the esoteric knowledge. It's the same tree under which Buddha found enlightenment, the world tree of the Mayans, 
the tree of life of the Aztecs, the great Nordic tree, Yggdrasil, that supports existence. And in Jewish mysticism, the science of the tree of life is called Kabbalah. But there's another tree in the garden, which is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which Adam and Eve were commanded not to eat from, or they would surely die. It was clear that the fruit of this tree was forbidden, yet they were tempted by the one thing in all of paradise that was denied to them. As I've already established, knowledge in Greek is gnosis, but not the kind that comes from reading books, but rather an internal direct spiritual knowledge. And in Hebrew, it's dot, the hidden sphere found in the Kabbalah, which traditionally is never spoken of or revealed. Close examination of the use of the word knowledge in the Bible gives strong indications of the nature of dot or gnosis. Adam knew his wife again and she bore a son. The maiden was very beautiful, a virgin who no man had known. It is clear to the observant reader that knowledge in the Bible relates to sexuality. Hence, the tree of knowledge, gnosis, is a direct reference to sexuality, which brings us to the forbidden fruit. But first, let us look at the Kedusha symbol, which is the famous staff of Hermes, but is also found in many other cultures. The two serpents have always symbolized the masculine and feminine energetic channels that wind up the spinal column. They are energetic, not physical, so they will not be found in any medical textbooks but they are representations that are fed by the sexual energy. These two channels are called Ida and Pingala in Sanskrit. In the Kabbalah, they are called Od and Ob. And in esoteric Christianity, they are symbolically represented by Adam and Eve. In an esoteric context, it is the feminine energy of Eve that pushes for procreation. When Eve is tempted to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge, this is a symbol of humanity desiring the fruit of sexuality or children. Temptation by the serpent led to the symbolic discovery of the orgasm. Tremendous energy is harnessed in the sensual act between a man and woman, where humanity has the God-given capacity to create, where man is the active force the reflection of God the Father, woman, the receptive force, the reflection of God the Mother, and sex as the force that brings them together, giving rise to all of creation and the foundation of the universal symbol of the Trinity, where three expresses one, but in order to create, this one divides into two, male and female. This is the mystery of the Holy Spirit, symbolized in India as Shiva Shakti, the creative and destructive power of God. One of the most sacred symbols of Shiva, the Holy Spirit, is the Lingam Yoni, the intersection of the phallus and uterus. The same symbol is found on the other side of the world in the alchemical tradition. The force that powers all creation on all levels of existence is carnal energy. This energy is symbolized by fire, by water, and by light. In the Bible it says, quote, When a man has an omission, he shall bathe his whole body in water and remain unclean until evening. <laughs> to indulge in the fruit of sexuality means to spill the vital energy, to climax, to waste the divine energy that illuminates the soul in order to feel physical sensation. Thus, the energy used to maintain the physical and spiritual vitality is expelled. The cup of Hermes is spilled. That said, Adam and Eve represented the sin of dispelling their vital energy, extinguishing the flame of life which not only sustains the vitality of the physical senses, but also vitality of the seven superior senses that unites mankind to the divine. Without the life force energy, also known as chi, prana, or vril, 
the soul atrophies, breaking our direct connection to God. This is also symbolically expressed as Samson losing his power when his hair was cut by Delilah, as not cutting one's hair represented a vow of chastity in certain esoteric sects. And so Samson lost his strength, fortitude, and spiritual connection by sleeping with Delilah. This is why it's said that those that fornicate, which esoterically means expelling the life force energy, cannot perceive God directly, and why priests, monks, and holy men in all cultures traditionally take vows to remain chaste. The orgasm is symbolized in the poison apple given to Snow White. While sweet to the taste of the physical senses, it is poison to the soul. Eating it results in unconsciousness and an eternity of sleep. The universal story of maidens and virtuous heroes falling asleep is an allegory illustrating the sleep of consciousness, the state in which the human being loses the direct personal knowledge of God and the higher realms of nature. This is why the fruit of the tree of knowledge was forbidden to eat. In mystery schools, the alternative to the abusing of the tree of knowledge are techniques of Tantra that are taught, where the initiate learns to amplify and harness the energy, circulating and storing it, rather than expelling and wasting it. In a Hebrew verse of the Zohar, which has been omitted from the modern Bible, it states that while the serpent was tempting Eve, it said that if one touches the fruit, but does not eat of it, they will not die. But their eyes would be open like gods or goddesses like the Elohim and said, look, I'm touching it and I did not die. In other words, through the sacred and controlled act of Tantra, one can illuminate their energetic bodies, activate their chakras and make love without disobeying God's command to not eat of the fruit, to not climax. So the lesson is not abstinence, but learning the sacred art of the flame of the Magi. This was the distinction between knowledge of good and evil, the difference between existing in paradise with God and being expelled or naked, which is symbolic of being unconscious or asleep, which leads to emotional and psychological suffering and pain. In tasting the forbidden fruit, Adam learned desire. From this moment, right and wrong is filtered subjectively through the need to feel pleasure and avoid suffering. Now, humanity knew what the Elohim knew, that desire leads to suffering. Desire is craving, and craving is suffering, a message inherent in every great religion. The slave of desire is a slave of sin, and only suffering and death await him. It was Buddha that said, Quote, through the abandonment of desire, the deathless state is realized. Thus, stripped of their connection to the divine, Adam and Eve, as symbols of humanity, were cast out of Eden to wander in a wilderness of suffering and ignorance. However, the gateway back to Eden and the tree of life was never closed nor locked. The entrance of the Garden of Eden is the same door through which Adam and Eve departed. By conquering the temptation of Lucifer, the fiery serpent, the raw carnal energy of lust must be refined into spiritual energy. And it is through the transmutation of this fire of life that the mystics claim the vehicle for the human soul is born. This is what is meant in the Bible when Jesus explains to Nicodemus that Unless a man be born again of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. The great arcanum is the secret knowledge of Tantra. There are three types, black, gray, and white. White Tantra is what is being presented here. In contrast to the serpent that tempted Eve and caused her to fall, There's a serpent of Moses made of bronze. Bronze is composed of two metals, copper and tin, masculine and feminine. 
The bronze serpent is created when the two polarities are brought together in purity. This is the great secret knowledge of alchemy, the chemistry of God. The prefix al is from the Arabic word Allah, as in the Hebrew el, which means God. Chem means to fuse or cast a metal. So alchemy is the method to fuse oneself once again with the divine. This is the key to the ancient mystery of alchemy, to transmute the lead of the ego and desire into the spiritual gold of consciousness, achieving gnosis, spiritual knowledge. This is likely one of the reasons society has been inundated by porn, whose damaging effects include addiction, isolation, distorted beliefs and perceptions about relationships and intimacy, negative feelings about themselves, neglecting other areas of their life, but also has trained users to frivolously squander their vital essence, debasing and degrading their ambition, intuition, magnetic charisma, and spiritual vitality by depleting their vril. Of course, there's many famous people in history that took advantage of this sacred esoteric teaching, such as Nikola Tesla who said, my brain is only a receiver in the universe. There is a core from which we obtain knowledge, strength, and inspiration. Nikola Tesla was connected to the divine and received divine inspiration and knowledge. Other famous practitioners of retention were Steve Jobs, the singer Prince, Plato, the Dalai Lama, Winston Churchill, Pythagoras, Isaac Newton, Mahatma Gandhi, Muhammad Ali, Beethoven, Mark Twain, Leonardo da Vinci, Socrates, not to mention countless pharaohs, kings, emperors, alchemists, and numerous leaders of nations, including Adolf Hitler. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon and through all other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description. Please subscribe for future updates. Leave your thoughts below. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.